pretend I'm tall. Um, I want to thank Peg, um, who does this amazing thing where she gets up here once a month and cheers on a big writing community and with so much grace and generosity. And I don't know how many of us openly thank you, but I wanted to speak on behalf of many of us. You know, I don't know if you know the history of why there are words, but Peg basically showed up in the Bay Area and saw that there was something like this missing and just kind of snapped her fingers, or so it appeared, and made this thing materialize out of thin air and it immediately became a really thriving, wondrous place and many of us have benefited from it. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to read... Um, not from the very beginning of this book, so I just want to tell you a little bit about it. And um, I love that Jane just mentioned the upstate New York region and the Onondaga County. So the character that I'm going to be reading right now is one of many characters in the book, but he's a Mohawk um, who I invented for my novel set in Schenectady where I grew up, upstate New York. But he's somebody that I wish I had known, and so I, um, I actually gave him some of my own experiences in a way because I really felt like I would have been a member of his tribe had I known how mm -hmm. to do that. And so um, this scene actually is a scene that sort of was something that I did in school, but it's what Martin does in high school. And it's 1965, when I was only five. <laughs> He's um, although Martin Longboat lived with his grandmother across the river, that is, on the side of the river supposedly outside the limits of Electric City, thanks to the complicated insistence of his father, he attended high school with all of the scientists' kids, the school with an Indian name. It alternately amused and infuriated him that no one there seemed to wonder about the translation, casually using the Iroquois words as if they all assumed the meaning of the language no longer mattered. Land of high corn, land beyond the pine trees. These were the timeless place names given by his forebears, the now invisible ones. There were still plenty of pine trees, but the fields of corn were shrinking year by year. He wondered often if he was the only one who noticed. It was nearly impossible to sit still in geology class, for instance, and hear the teacher droning about metamorphic terrain and post-glaciation. How could they care so much about scratches and chatter marks on shale? without knowing the histories of this land and of his tribe. Whenever he stayed up late at night listening to his homemade recordings of elders speaking Mohawk, and considered the idea that the Electric City Museum ought to collect such things, he always ended up assuring himself that he was better at safekeeping than any museum could ever be. Even the battered trunk with a broken lock served as a treasure chest when it was draped with one of Annie's handmade quilts. He would have had to teach the basics of listening, and he had no idea how to explain the subtleties of telling stories by beginning with you instead of I. On his high school English papers, that same you was repeatedly crossed out with red marks, replaced in the teacher's handwriting with her strangely detached one. It would take more patience than he possessed to explain that in his own tongue there was a we that meant you and I, while another word for we meant he or she and I, but not you. The language of including and excluding could be simple, but not easy. Why share this legacy with people who owned too much already? and yet seemed oblivious to the value of preserving what they claimed, not the land, not the river, 
not even the houses they built or the machines they made. The letters in the sky and the kitchen appliances and the things that came after. In the faintest background of certain tapes, Martin recognized the cacophony of mayflies, their singing so brief and urgent. You know how to quiet everything down toward a center point, a place where even your breath is barely a disturbance, like the mirrored surface of a pond. Present to nothingness, you can be present to all, even as, even as you stay off to the side somewhere, watching. You keep waiting to hear someone tell the true story of the massacre at the stockade. Instead, all you get is the twisted history being told all wrong about who fought and who died. To refer to women and children as combatants? You feel rage in your fingers, the muscles in your legs tighten with a confusing mix of defiance and helplessness. Who made up these words? And who claimed the right to use the names of your people for their street signs and subdivisions? The wrongs are everywhere. Trapped behind your desk in the angry voice you keep inside, you challenge the teachers to talk about American history in a different way. You dare them to learn the whole of what happened before they claim to know the facts. The inside voice threatens to erupt, especially now that massacres seem to be happening all over again, in jungles on the other side of the world. Today, a November morning, you get in trouble for refusing to say the Pledge of Allegiance, sent to the principal for remaining in your seat with your fists clenched. You don't even bother to explain to the homeroom teacher why you will not say words that aren't true, won't even shape your mouth around them. In the principal's office, you mumble something about hypocrisy, about the lies of freedom and justice for all, when you know better, know what it's been like for your ancestors, and even now, for all the so-called non-white people, which really means the ones with no money and no power. I don't pledge my allegiance, you say. I won't put my hand over my heart, not for this flag. You can't make me. You sit up straighter in the hard wooden chair. You don't want to get into any argument or negotiation. Amazingly, the principal listens. Mr. Borden leans forward and keeps his palms flat on his oak desk. You are shocked to realize that this middle-aged, freckle-faced man really does seem to want to understand, and his milky blue eyes are fixed with great seriousness on you. He wears a tightly buttoned collar and a green tie with some kind of white bird printed on it, and you wonder if Borden genuinely cares about birds or nature in general if he spends time with his children. Does he take his daughters on camping trips or maybe swimming? Does he teach them the names of birds and trees? The principal says, I want to suggest a compromise. You remember a spelling lesson. The principal is your pal. You hold your tongue. Remember that? You hold your tongue, wondering if this is how it used to happen every time the promise made and the promise broken. But here's how it lands. You agree to stand wordlessly during the recitation of the pledge, hands by your side, and staying loyal to yourself while acknowledging the rights of the others to speak their own truth. The flag will keep hanging in the corner of the room where you do not have to look at it. On the way home from school, you find out that on the very same day of your own small resistance, a young man planted himself in front of the United Nations building in New York City and set his own body on fire. He is burned beyond saving. The blackout that follows doesn't seem anywhere near as shocking as this piece of news, carried on radio waves into the very hollow of your chest, exploding. Thank you.